It's ad break time. The Beyond Solitaire podcast is proudly sponsored by Central Michigan University's Center for Learning Through Games and Simulations. Keep an eye out for 500-Year-Old Vampire, which will hit Kickstarter sometime this spring. Also, there's a new course to sign up for. Starting on May 16th, Travis Hill will teach Finding Your Niche, expanding your skill set across five different gaming genres. You should definitely check that out. And finally, a plug for myself. As summer approaches, I dream of a year where I do not have to teach summer school and can spend that time working on my channel instead. If you want to make this dream a reality, head over to patreon.com slash beyondsolitaire and give me some support. Every little bit helps. For now, though, let's get on with the show. Hey, gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and this week I have a very special guest. This is Dr. Maurice Suckling. He's assistant professor in the Games and Simulations Arts and Sciences program at RPI. How are you doing, Maurice? Hello. Good morning, Liz. Hey, it's good to have you on. And um, what is it like to work in such an esteemed and long-named program? <laughs> very extraordinarily acronymy. There's, um, there's, I mean, it's a whole minefield of, of just, I feel bad for the people who first show up. And they're GSASing and RPIing and uh, you know it's and CNMing. It's it's a whole thing. So, but you know, obviously, uh, you get used to it. <laughs> so, what kind of classes are you teaching right now? So, I teach. Uh, th there are sort of two areas I specialize in. One is games writing. So that's uh, both sort of all the dialogue stuff that you might think about, but also narrative design stuff so the stuff that uh, players might not ever see that helps construct a a narrative experience so it might be branching structures or uh, other storytelling systems so that's often applicable to to video games but also has applications into board games and then the other thing that i do is i do teach some historical simulations classes as well specializing mostly would you believe it in board games what amazing but board games uh have not been here for everything you have a pass in video games yes yes so i'm a i'm a new i still i mean i guess this is six years or seven years that i've been at rpi but prior to that i spent 20 something not quite sure years making video games mostly as a writer sometimes um a designer or a narrative designer or uh, perhaps a voice director uh, various other roles and uh, yeah so I, I think I don't actually know I haven't counted recently but it's something over 50 50 video games that have, have come out my my very first game was a game called driver in 1999 and uh, that was on the PlayStation it didn't even have a one on the end it just was a PlayStation because it was you know it was new so yeah since then I've spent a lot of time uh, looking at spreadsheets and uh, word documents and um you know builds of games that are not very playable and then jumping onto the next the next project to try and throw some words at it i was originally hired so reflections the company that made uh, driver they hired me for two weeks and they said uh, i was hired they said can you we just want to hire you we just want you to throw a story at this uh, you've got two weeks and I, I think i was there for about 13 years on and off as a contractor so you know we we were just at this cusp when we were just learning about the storytelling potential of, of video games tomb raider had was just coming out this was new so this was a driving game the studio originally made uh, destruction derby and and some driving sims and they had this idea that they wanted to create this sort of uh they, they described it as a living breathing city it was a it was a 3d world when uh sort of free roaming sandbox world when gta at the time was just a was a top-down game and uh so yeah that was kind of my odyssey into beginning of my odyssey into into video game writing that's really interesting and so what made you uh, transition over to board games because I see you a lot in in board game world and I feel like that's what you're making right now and also seems to be what you're teaching. Yeah, well, I I sort of fell into video games by accident. The the things that I played as a kid were, uh, you know, I we didn't we had an Atari twenty six hundred and we had a BBC B, uh, but we weren't really big video gamers, computer gamers. We I grew up playing miniature war games with little soldiers and 
hex encounter games, things like uh, SPI's Napoleon's Last Battles and uh, Mark McLaughlin's War and Peace and Imperium Romanum and these sort of uh, 70s behemoths. Uh, the, I, I, Kingmaker was a big game that I have two brothers. We used to play Kingmaker, three player Kingmaker, which you know probably doesn't work out all that well really, but we sank a lot of hours into, into that. So it, in, in some ways it was a, a return to my real uh, sort of interest from from being a, a a kid i just was able to, to to kind of transition back into it but i'd really spent about 10 years not in board games at all in the 90s to the early 2000s i think there were a lot of people leaving the hobby at that that sort of time uh, the, the games were just getting too too big and cumbersome jason matthews described it as uh, war games destroyed itself in this in this time games were getting really big they were really difficult uh, kind of on ramps for for players and uh, you know rules that were too 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 large and it took too long to play and you know i would just about get get the game set up by by the time i had to pack it away and use the table for something so i i just sort of fell away from it and you know was working a lot and, and not working from home, I was traveling all around the, the world at the time. And then I, I just, early 2000s, I, I just started playing um, Battle Line, a Reiner Knizia game, which is not really a war game at all, but has some sort of veneer of a of a war game and uh, Condottieri, which is more of a war game of sorts, but still very much a, a kind of, you might describe it as a Euro type war game with decks and a, a few small pieces, a tiny little board. and uh, yeah, around about that that time, I think Quartermaster General, Ian Brody's Quartermaster General was probably one of those ones that I realized, oh, these are the kinds of games that I'm interested in in playing. And in fact, all through this this time, even when I I, I, I was working in video games, I'd always kind of tinker away at, at board game design, but it was becoming increasingly detached from really what was going on in the industry because I didn't really have any idea. And then around about the early 2000s, I started realizing, oh, these there are games here that I'm interested in 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 playing that kind of have my that, that kind of right difficulty level and the right kind of uh, play experience and they they match my own interest as a player but also as a designer and oh maybe maybe i even have something to say in this in this space and then i i got this new job where i didn't have to worry i was a freelancer throughout almost that whole 20 something years so really hard to justify oh i think i'll just I don't know, make a game for a week instead of hustling for work or you know, doing the work. So um, it, it just, it, it came to be that I, I had a bit of time and space because I had a salary coming in where I could explore my own interests in this, this uh, games, simulation, art, arts and sciences program, GSAS is <laughs> we acronym it. Uh, really afforded me the, the ability to just figure out what is it you want to, to do? You would have to do some research. I wasn't even an assistant professor at the time. I was um, a professor of practice. So I, even then I had a research profile and there was some expectation that I do something. And there's a lot going on in video games but uh, and in narrative, but I just was drawn back to, to board games and RPI is not that far from the battlefield of Saratoga uh, well, Saratoga was really two battles, Freeman's Farm and Bemis Heights. And I just sort of fell into, I just made a design of, of a board game for Freeman's Farm and sent it to Worthington because they made the sorts of games that it, it felt like it, it fitted with the sort of games that they made. And, you know, sent it off and expected to, to just get a rejection in eight months or not get a rejection and go to another publisher but then they yeah they called and said they wanted to publish it so then i was like whoa i'm off on this whole new trajectory now and i've been making board games since then oh that's awesome and i've also noticed that board games are a large part of your research program so do you want to talk about what you've been writing about recently maybe we could dig a, dig into that for a bit and then move on to what you've been designing sure so i have been uh well, bits and pieces, so chapters for other people's books. MIT have a, a book called Playing Space, and I, I wrote a short chapter 
in there. They're all, all very short chapters just about how uh, the way that we approach space in board games has carries some historiographic meaning, meaning that it, it, it means something the way that we approach the space. It's not just um, colorful or, <laughs> or just, you know, scale, even scale means something. So uh, I, I just did a very quick summary and talked about how there are broadly three main ways that we, that we cut space up in, in board games. We, we have regulated grids, of course, which, you know, hexes are the, sort of the champions of that, but prior to hexes, we squares were very popular. And we also have area control maps, which are often bound by national borders or, or topographic meaning. And we also have point to point maps, which, which operate along historically reasonable axes of operation. So cities, often forts, transport hubs, and, and so on. And all these different approaches, all these different ways of thinking about space are saying something about the nature of that, that space. In, in a hex grid, for example, you're saying that space is knowable, that it's that you can know how long it's going to take you to get from one space to another because there are, comp there are movement modifiers on, on a, a, a forest or a swamp hex, for, for example. But you know, does space always work that way? If you take, for example, Burgoyne's march down from Canada to Freeman's farm, he, did he really have a regulated grid map that could tell him exactly how long it would take him to get there and what it would be like and what the what his movement allowance would be? Well, obviously not. So, you know, it's 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 an abstraction that lets us uh, attempt to model uh, model something, but in in some ways. You know, what are we modeling if we are saying that these things are knowable when they're perhaps not knowable? Anyway, uh, um, so that's that was uh, one chapter. I've been writing a chapter for a book on post-colonial board games. I've been talking about uh, design elements in post-colonial board games, the way in which some of the tools that we have now that are coming through, particularly through coin games and prior to that, to the work of, from the work of Brian Train, but it, it actually st extends a little bit further back uh, as well. They allow us to think in post-colonial terms. So by that, I mean, they allow us to look at things from a multiplicity of perspectives that aren't only concerned necessarily with uh, expansion and imperial control. The coin games are very good at showing these asymm asymmetries that uh, demonstrate the political complexity of, of a a given conflict, which speak to the, the, the variety of different perspectives in place and how simply having the most troops at a place doesn't necessarily, isn't necessarily that important. There's all these other elements to do with political will and your willingness to, to suffer casualties and your uh, willingness to disappear. If you think about irregular warfare, which Volko and Brian have both talked about, in, in various places about how essentially that's the default mode of, of warfare, but we it, it's, it's poorly represented as a whole and, and has been until really predominantly the work of, of, of Volko and, and Brian, but there are others. And I, I think that it's now reaching a point of some significance where there's, there's a real uh, plethora of designers and publishers interested in, in this space. So that's also something I, I'm writing about. I'm, I'm writing about the, the way in which we now have uh, the Red Banus, for example. Uh, we have these, these games that are, which is about the, the French invasion of, of Algeria and you don't play as the French, you play all as Alg Algerians. And I, I'm interested in the way in which this is happening. And of course, you and I both connected with the Zenobia Award, which has been fantastic at championing this this idea of, of giving representation to uh, underrepresented parts of the the community and so many of those games are tapping into what i would really consider post-colonial topics or from post-colonial perspectives so the the liberation of haiti the the, the revolution and um various various other topics in 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 that in that regard and it's 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 actually really exciting it's really starting to happen um, and I, I'm tremendously encouraged by the work that's being done in that that space, and perhaps um, 
reasonably optimistic that that could continue. I know that there's more uh, Zenobia plans, and that's that's great to see. But I, yeah, I think I think something is happening in that in that space that isn't happening if you listen to to Jason Jason Perez on the shelf stories. You know, he he bemoans in that more kind of mainstream board game space. He bemoans the fact that it's it's really an uphill struggle for people to approach history with more complex nuanced per perspectives and i'm not suggesting that the historical board war game space is, is is flawless it's it's not but things are there is some traction starting to happen there so fun fact for those of you who are listening jason and i are actually doing a book club podcast in a little bit with a book about games and colonialism so you can you can wait and hear more on that matter in the future but for now um so maurice when you use the term post-colonialism you know in academia that has a very specific theoretical meaning so mm -hmm. um do you want to kind of give people a general understanding of what that is so that if they want to like look at your work or or related works that post-colonialism is is contextualized for them yeah well um, ac academics often talk about two particular types of colonialism. They, they talk about settler colonialism and uh, exploitation colonialism. So the, the former is people come to stay and they there's a, a, a drive to be uniform, which obviously kind of can destroy the indigenous culture. And in exploitation uh, colonialism, there's there's not such a, a desire to to move in, but there's a desire to extract what there is and to allow a diversity to to persist, but not necessarily a diversity in a way that we might feel good about. It's it's more that there's a willingness to sustain the separation between these 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 cultures. So that's some of what uh, some of how people describe colonialism, and then post-colonialism is is moving beyond that that state. In, in some regard, but there are lots of definitions as you as you say, Liz, and uh, in, in particular, I'm interested in the definition that's that's connected to, to the idea of, it's connected to Marxism and these, these ideas of how the anti-colonialist movement that we associate, that, that comes bound up in, in Marxism, uh, allows us to think in, in what we could call post-colonial ways, the ways in which it's, it's beyond a, a mindset that's to do with expansion and and control of others. It's 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 about trying to uh, liberate those people from those kinds of frameworks. Interesting. So my own personal academic interest in in Poco has just been I love subaltern studies, trying to listen to the underrepresented voice in history. And is that something that is coming through in your current work right now? In my actual design work. Uh, no, in your academic work. Um, in my academic work, yeah, I mean, I'm just starting to. So, post-colonialism -colonial, is is one aspect of, of of stuff that I'm looking at in relation to to board games. And, and as I said, I, I think that we're starting to to see this in in some in some of the games that are happening now, and in in, in some of the design tools that that we now have. Like I say, in part to do with the kind of things that Coin gives us these these ways of thinking about well uh, victory isn't about domination of, of territories it might be something quite different it might be a more conceptual notion of, of, of support for example kind of the, the support of a of a populace so yes i i am seeing that i'm, I'm seeing that uh, in, really increasingly since the sort of 2010s kind of 2012 2010 and, and a bit before it's really started to to uh, accelerate in my mind, but you know, there's, there's so much more work to do to to sustain it and maintain that that momentum. It, it's easily it easily dissipates if we're not careful. But I do think that it's not just outliers of designers and a publisher saying, "I'll have a go at that." I think that I think that there's a I think publishers can identify that that there's there's a threshold now that's been perhaps crossed, and that there's an appetite in the marketplace for games that come at things from different angles that are interested in different perspectives.
Yeah, absolutely. So I'm just going to be a pill and ask this because it's it's my job and then we'll move on to something nicer. But uh, <laughs> so when we talk about post-colonialism, you know, this is very much about the impact on societies that have been subject to colonial powers and how they, you know, determine how to approach their history and culture afterwards. So I have noticed in your work on post-colonialism, like the chapters that I've read so far, that the, you know, Zenobia aside that we mentioned earlier, the designers you're citing in here tend to be white men. And to what extent does that concern you? And how do you think that impacts whether a game can really be post-colonial? Um, I mean, it concerns me <laughs> a great deal. Uh, I, I would say it's, often it's a it's a start and you have to start somewhere and these these citations uh, are not in and of themselves the end of the discussion they they show some scholarly endeavor and you know we can't necessarily expect our game designers to also get ahead of the scholarly debate as well as move their games into into a new space but I mean, I think that for one thing, it's a start. For another thing, it's you can bring with you some self-awareness of those of those limitations, and you don't get to uh, dodge that no matter where you're where you're from, because you're still perhaps talking about debates back in time that you can't you can't control, you know, you, you don't know really what happened uh, in um, Roman Britain, for example. And I might be British and have no particular concerns that I should be, you know, I feel like I, I, I'm allowed to work in that space. I feel like I, I have some understanding about British culture. That means I feel like I can do that. But my connection to the uh, Britons of first century AD is not great. You know, I don't know that much about what really went on and what i do know is told to me by romans who are often living 200 years after writing it 200 years after the things happen so um you know i i remain concerned about about that but all i can do is press on kind of try and check my my sources try and use what i can try and uh, hold things up to the light and understand the the constraints of those of those sources and and realize that you know, i'm not alone from the you know the rest of the academic community is also not sure really what to say about this there's lots of hypotheses and and, and best guesses and uh you know i i'm just doing my best to to try and be aware of that and and keep things moving forwards and to hope that something that I can do is, is be involved in something like Zenobia and, and work with those designers or, you know, my own PhD students might not necessarily be my own ethnographic profile. And, and I can try and find ways to encourage them and bring them into the, the discussion. So the other thing that really interests me about your, your citations, right, is that they also represent I guess a change that I'm really happy to see in the interaction between academics and people who aren't in the academy who do history, which is that you are, you know, Cole Worley is a fully fledged, fully trained historian, right? Mm -hmm. But um, a lot of our historical games are not made by people who are specifically experts in the subject area they're designing games about. And um, I also think that academia doesn't necessarily acknowledge like these sort of non peer reviewed comments on history. So how do you feel that that is changing? And how do you feel that your work is placed on that spectrum of, you know, taking non-official PhD historian seriously and also doing academic work yourself? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, that's a good question. I think that, I, I you know, I'm, it's interesting you bring up Cole because he, he was saying something interesting about how uh, he, he was wondering it's not quite your your question actually but uh, <laughs> he, he was he was saying how i think you'd asked him a question uh, this is a previous podcast of yours you'd asked him a question about could could games count as scholarship and and he said oh, you know uh, he wasn't sure about that that if i can paraphrase him brutally but that he had this idea that they were perhaps art and that uh, they weren't quite quite scholarship. And I thought that was an interesting idea, but I I also thought 
if I could add anything to that, it would be that um, we could think of the game itself as scholarship, and then we could flip it on its head and just say, games are scholarship, and uh, how effective is this game? Uh, uh, and in what ways, in what ways does it do what it is that it's purporting to do? And, and how does it do that? So that's sort of my take in so far as I don't work with, with history students. I don't work with, with, with scientists or anyone with, with any particular specialism. I work with game students who are interested in, in, a, in a game. So I'm never in a situation where I'm kind of stealthily trying to bring a game in and say, aha, you know, I've taught you something. I, I'm always front and center saying, here's the game. Let's play it. Let's talk about how it's working, why it's working, what it's doing, what do you think it's doing? And in order to really conduct any sort of analysis of that, it's required of those students to to delve into the history if it's a history game in, in some way to, to sort of help deconstruct what what is happening but now i think i have lost what your question ultimately was <laughs> basically just um you know how does it how does it feel and how is it being professionally treated you know as an academic to take non-academic works that are also sort of modern commentaries on history seriously uh well i mean I, the real answer to that is, is I, I guess I'll find out when people get upset with me. But <laughs> for, for me, it feels fantastic. So I, I don't have a PhD in history. I have a master's in, in global history. And um, to me, that I, I feel like I can, I can justify my approach as a game designer through through the research that I do and through the the citations that I that I bring, but I'm I, I'm always attempting to persuade players that I didn't just pluck it out of the air, and that there's some reason behind what I've what I've done, and and I'm trying to generate some kind of some kind of argument. In in fact, to to, to bring Cole drag him back into the conversation, he probably doing something else and now is in this conversation by accident but uh that you know, he talked about in that same podcast i remember him talking about how he was interested in games not as an argument but as a uh, i don't remember exactly what phrase he used but but essentially what to my mind he's talking about is as a dialectic as a way in which you can have this kind of debate about about the meaning you know my my first degree was in uh Bristol University in the UK, it was in religion with literature, which was this odd little subject that five of us did. And it was a mix of theology and philosophy and literary theory and literature and oh, that's uh, some, some history. And it was great. And the, but the central idea of that really turned out to be, I realized after about two years of, of doing the course was, was that actually, uh, theology is perhaps, a, let me phrase that another way, that that dogma is probably a poor way of, of handling theology. That if you want to talk about God and philosophy and, and meaning, a much better forum for that might be literature, where you have a dialectic, a debate that, that's thriving and dynamic and alive, right? So, so this is one of the things that, that makes people think in terms of a distinction between literature with a capital L and literature with a small L, that, that it has this capacity to, to have meaning that, 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 that keeps moving. It's kind of bouncing off of itself. Um, that, that's why people would much rather read War and Peace than read summaries of you know, what, what happens in it. And I see a, a parallel with, with games and that the same thing is going on that, that I think if we're doing it well, we're creating a dialectic where people are, we're not so much creating an argument that this is the case, here is what happened. We're saying here are the, 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 the varieties of possibilities and these things uh, could happen or had, had more likelihood to happen. There was more determinism in this and this was perhaps less predetermined and there was more agency here and less agency there. And it, you end up with this, this kind of complex picture of, of history rather than a, you know, just a, a line. Let me tell you, here is what happened. This is, this is the thing you need to understand. And that's the real value of, of games. You're, you're moving beyond just, you know, dates and places, you're moving into this space where the the, the thing is a living system. It's a it's sort of an organism that, that you're uh, having this connection with. 
All right. So now that we've gotten this good understanding of where you're coming from when it comes to historical games, how we treat them, maybe how to make them, tell us about your class. So you said that you're teaching a history and historical simulations class. Is that mm -hmm. correct? So yes. what what are you covering and what is it like? And you know, how are you communicating all of this to your students in a digestible way? So I I, I taught it once just at the beginning of the the uh, pandemic and then had a, a paternity leave. So I didn't come back to it, but I will be coming back to it soon, hopefully, hopefully next year. And it, it took the form of really trying to put often war games, at least to begin with, in front of people. And, you know, people hadn't played a hex encounter game before. So I wanted them to see what that was and to and to understand what a CRT, a combat results table was and think about how we represent combat and movement and how we think about command control. So it, it was, you know, a whole broad introduction of here is what war games have, here's where they've come from, tracing some of this back, this history back to, to Kriegspiel and, and, and beyond, and then bring it up to date and saying, you know, let's, I want to show you some of these games from the seventies and the, and the eighties. Um, and then, and then spun it into more recent games, but it was all wrapped in a, a, a context of, so this, these are graduate courses for what we, it's part of our, our graduate program, which is to, called critical game design. So it's all wrapped in this context of, let's think about everything that happens in a game the game is not just a game everything is telling us something and most things are telling us lots of things and why are they telling us why do we think that how did the how did the designers make us think that how is it working what's just let's break the thing apart and try and understand what's happening so you know that that's the advantage of, of working with those kinds of students is they're down for that they want that they they they're here for i you know, they might not be into board games from the 1980s necessarily, but they they do want to understand how games are put together and understand how those tools could be reapplied in, in their own stuff, perhaps, and understand how how it's it's intersecting with history, perhaps. But but beyond anything else, they're learning processes, they're learning ways ways to think. They're basically learning uh, critical thinking in, in the same way that they would in lots of other academic contexts they just they just you know we start with the assumption that here is a game and it might look like it's uh, a very simple uh, uh, walmart shelf game that you know there's nothing to it but let's br even that means something you know even risk is is saying something about the way that we think about the world you know, it's a, to me a very good example of a, of a sort of colonialist perspective right everything everyone expands you don't get a say unless you've got armies and the best armies the ones with the most win well that's i mean it's hard to be more clearly colonialist than that so let's break that down and figure out what's the thinking behind that both from a a, a broad conceptual level and also let's think about the the game mechanics is it balanced you know how, how does it work why why three dice for attack and two for, for defense or what, what have you so everything gets everything gets examined so that I hope that even if my students don't work in board games, most of them go on to work in games in some capacity, that they they just they are equipped with tools to think about the world in a in an analytical way. They're careful about their assumptions. They try and check themselves and and try and think through why they think they think things. Yeah, I like that. You and I are very much in agreement that you know um, I feel like the ultimate thesis of my podcast, even though I didn't think I started with one, ended up being, right? There's no such thing as just a game. You can treat it as just a game, um, but every game says something. There are cultural artifacts, and they are statements of something that the designer decided to, you know, abstract from the real world. And, yeah, I mean, if you're not thinking about it, like, you're missing out, really. But <laughs> Yeah, and, you know, sometimes the designer isn't aware of what they've done. They, they, they perhaps put stuff together. They think they've done something else, but perhaps... They've, they've done something that might surprise them to hear that they have actually uh, made some arguments that they were actually not intending to to make. So, you know, that that can be interesting, an interesting discussion to figure out, well, what's 
what do you think the designer was, was trying to do and and why and I, I don't know i suppose monopoly is kind of an example of of that in some regards right it's a bit more complicated than that but in some ways it, it's the opposite of what she originally intended oh yeah it's actually that's a that is a good true story for sure uh so then i guess the other question is, so is your program mostly focused on video games and if so um, how do like board games fit in and you know are they kind of yeah. like the quirky thing that you do or do people kind of see them as part of the same field now you know so in the six or whatever it is six or seven years that i've been there i would say that it began the case that uh, it was mostly video games that's mostly what people were, were talking about that's mostly what people seem to be interested in and i think that's really changed now and I, one of my colleagues is is uh, he's been here about three years he's he's more of a tabletop specialist and one of my other colleagues in in a different department uh, actually you should talk to him chris johnson he, he he does a lot of work with games and media and adaptations and how these games sort of adaptations of, of famous books or uh, movies are turned into games and, and what's the relationship there and what's the, how are we handling adaptation and so on but but so i think it's changed i think it's, it's noticeably changed in the last six years and it's now the case that uh you know we have discussions about hey do you think we can do a dedicated analog uh concentration for our, our students and you know whether, whether that happens or not i don't i don't know but it it's it's not the case that it's just this weird thing that i do and everyone's just like i know what that's about um, but <laughs> it's it's yeah i had two at least two other colleagues who were doing stuff meaningfully in that in that space and uh, actually i suspect more um and i think it's it's gaining some some traction you know there are tremendous advantages i don't know if you ever tried to play video games with a class of 20 students and uh, make it fun for all of them it's hard nope. <laughs> do you have do you have 20 controllers you know do you have the right equipment that there are logistical problems but if you put i, I often will get uh, multiple copies of the same board game and the whole class will play that game together in groups of whatever four or four or five uh, that logistically you're making your life much easier i'm not worried about technology breaking down so um, you know, there, there are real advantages and I, I think it's, yeah, I, I think that we are, again, I'm probably too ridiculously uh, short on sleep and optimistic, but, but I feel like um, we're also at this moment where in games programs and in the academic space, board games are being considered more seriously as a, as a contributory element to, to the whole game space as they should all right so and then i know that you are designing games uh you're designing at least one about ancient rome so why don't you tell us what you're working on uh because i'm always happy to talk about about rome <laughs> sure so well this is a game uh i'm designing with daniel burt and it's it's about roman britain so uh, first century roman britain and it, it comes from uh so the constant game jam that fred Saval set up in 2020 he, the first one happened uh yeah i think october 2020 that was a uh, three days to make a game using a pre-existing coin game you could only use the board of a pre-existing game you could use the wooden pieces you could use some stickers you could use uh you could make new cards but you basically had three days to do something that that, that kind of riffed off of a coin game didn't have to necessarily be a coin game, but I had to use that those components. So Daniel and I made a game that was about Boudicca's revolt. Yes. And uh, Team Boudicca. <laughs> right, and in part, in part because we only had three days, and you can imagine how much research you have to do to make a historical board game. And we had understood the assignment, and we had understood that you know what, there's very few sources on this. We got some Tacitus, some Cassius Dio that's about it some archaeology so we felt like you know what we can probably get through the research material rapidly enough to start on the actual design so we we made that that game and it worked out pretty well we came second place in fact in, in the end and then jason carr from gmt said hey do you want to maybe develop this some more and we, we developed it a bit more and we reached a point where he said you could either make this a uh, a full 
endorsed expansion for Pendragon, which was the, the game that we that we bounced off of, and, and work with Morgan. Uh, or maybe you want to make it into your own thing. There's this irregular conflict series that they had starting up, or, or they said maybe you even want to turn it into your own series. So we thought about it and we decided, you know what, let's try and make it our own thing. Let's let's ditch some of the coin things that we had that that uh, just felt like it didn't necessarily fit with some of the direction that we were going. We wanted a, a shorter, faster game experience. Um, not that you can't have that in coin necessarily, but we we decided that there were some other uh, I kind of hesitate to use the term, but a bit more Euro-y type mechanics that we were interested in incorporating to for, for the kind of game experience that we wanted. And yeah, then that that kind of developed and we got a, a Ken Kuhn as a, 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 a staff developer at GMT. And we got on P500 and we're now somewhere, I'm not sure, 450 or something. I think we're about 50 away from it, it kind of doing the, tick in the box uh, to, to kind of get it into development so uh, into full development so yeah we've been playing that and you of course you played an early version of this with david david thompson when we <laughs> were still and successfully broke it congratulations um early on as we we realized that our balance wasn't working yet but so that's that game so it's a one to four player game and it plays in about 60 minutes maybe 90 minutes but it's a pretty fast playing game about rebellions it's not about the invasion and it's not about agricola it's it's about sort of rome playing whack-a-mole with this this asymmetric setup of these these various different rebellions rise up and you've got to figure out how to how to well how to crush them but you're not necessarily interested in um just marching your armies everywhere marching your armies sometimes causes more trouble than it than it solves and for the for the britons they might be more interested in political tension rather than uh, raising war bands. So, yeah, we definitely are leveraging some uh, some coin there, but also go back to quartermaster general using some of that that design philosophy, if you like, uh, was also what we have. You know, we have deterministic combat, and it's extremely it's card driven as opposed to menu driven. And it's mostly just to play a card on your turn. There's a bit more to it than that. But um, yeah, so that's been working out really well. I'm really excited about how that's that's progressing. And yeah, just hoping that we 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 kind of get through to to, to P500. But so one of the things we were talking about was was that's an opportunity to do some of that post-colonial work we were talking about earlier, where you know, where are the games on the Zange? Slave revolt. Where are the games on the on the Mixton War kind of Mixton rebellion? These, these kind of lesser known rebellions that we realized they they're not they're under represented in the gaming space because rebellions are, are kind of a bit clunky and a bit awkward. Though they've got these bit asymmetries to them that can make them difficult propositions for designers. We think of them as just well, the big boot comes in and just slams them shut, right, and just kind of squashes them. Isn't that kind of how it works? And we want to say no. There's there's far more going on here in this story than just, you know, Rome doesn't just invade and then decide, oh, maybe we'll go build a wall so people can make a Euro type game about that in a couple of thousand <laughs> years. You know, there's there's stuff happening, you know, that the, the Britons didn't just kind of lay down and go, oh, I guess they beat us. You know, the Britons were constantly fighting each other, but were also finding out, looking for ways to kind of antagonize and, and weren't entirely defeated either. You know, some of those tribes in, in Wales, the Silurians, for example, were a constant pain in the backside. The Romans couldn't ever really kind of figure out what to do with them or how to how to address them. And they'd march in and the Silurians would just disappear into the mists. And Rome would be left with, well, I guess we'll kind of look after this fort for a bit until some of us go home, in which case, if you don't leave enough there, they get attacked. So, you, you know, I was interested in... It, <sighs> I was interested in how many more stories there are to, to be told from the history that we have, how we kind of fixate on these, these tired, reliable narratives that are very comforting in some ways, and how if you just keep pushing and probing and digging, you find far more interesting, unsettling stories, or stories that, that ascribe agency to people. We often just write off, we just, you know, we often don't think about the ancient Britons as being fighters we, th we we think of them as being defeated and Boudicca being upset and then losing and then 
I don't know, Romans go home 400 years later. There's, there's a lot more to be said. Indeed, there is. But this is about as long as my interviews usually run. So uh, I'll ask you the fun questions. What are you playing for fun right now? Well, you know, there's games of work and <gasps> work is fun. So um, I feel like everything, come back to what we were talking about earlier, I feel like everything uh, that, I'm, that I'm playing, I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about how they did it, why they did it. I'm, th I'm thinking about, is this stuff that I like? And if so, why? I've pl been playing a lot of War of the Ring with Chris Johnson, the, the friend, colleague I mentioned earlier, because we're talking about writing a book um, for that. You remember you had Paul Booth and Aaron Trammell on talking about their press. Uh, yeah, so we're, we're talking about writing a book for them in that in that series on War of the Ring, just specifically on that on that game. So we've been playing a lot of that. Uh, yesterday I played some Votes for Women, Fort Circle, Tory Brown's game. About Very the, nice game. Yeah, really enjoyed that. We played that as a, as a three player. I played some free at last recently as well. Just got that to the to the table and uh, border states by Shackos. So, yeah, look, I mean, you know, Alan Emmerich talked about, hey, this is Iron Triangle, right? That you can play games, you can make games, you can have a life, but you can only have two of those three. And I found a, a sort of a way through where students come and do independent studies with me, and they they get to be given a slew of board games and they go away and they learn them and they bring them to me, teach me, we play them. They get a, a an experience with a with a professor talking about the game and thinking about it, deconstructing it on a kind of one-to-one -one basis often. Uh, and I get to kind of stay up to speed with the hobby and get to experience these these games that, I, you know, as you well know, it's hard to keep on top of the just how many are coming out and how interesting they, they look. So it helps me kind of stay there. Indeed, indeed. And then if people want to uh, contact you, ask you questions, or just follow your work, where can you be found online? So Twitter, I, I, th I think I'm still in Twitter. I don't know. I think I am. Uh, so that's at right game read, right with a W, like you were writing. Right game read is probably the best place that seems to be where I do most of my being in the board games community. Fantastic. And I'll make sure the handle shows up in the show notes. Maurice, thank you so much for coming on. This has been a delightful conversation. Your students are lucky, and I'm really curious to see what you'll do next. And I'm excited about your Boudicca game. Thank you, Liz. Thanks a lot. All right. So those of you out here who are listening, hopefully you know by now, I can be found anywhere, anywhere online as Beyond Solitaire. So please like, subscribe, comment, ask questions, and most of all, happy gaming.